Hello, good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live from our news up here at Tadesawe Kanda. Also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. I am Alfred Kansi. Tonight, renowned economist and NPP stalwart Kwame Pienim defends the governor of the central bank against calls for his resignation. But some economists disagree with Kwame Pienim's position on this matter. We have details for you. Stay with us. Also, a former Northern Regional Chair of the New Patriotic Party, who is described as a star witness in the center of the alleged plot to remove the Inspector General of Police, Daniel Bugri Nabu, pulls a no show as the Parliamentary Committee investigating the matter commences sitting. We have a key member of that committee joining us tonight. Stay with us here. Also, the havoc in parts of the Upper East region as farmlands are inundated with water following the spillage of the Bakhra Dam in neighboring Burkina Faso. Tonight, we hear from the affected people and the farmers who are demanding a solution to this perennial problem. And we hear from the National Disaster Management Organization as well. Tonight, we have questions about the state of affairs with regards to the Palugu Multipurpose Dam which was meant to store the excess water that is causing destruction. Now, what's the state of affairs with that? Stay with us. We have some questions on that. As always, we are very, very interactive. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get talking. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. The governing New Patriotic Party has given its strongest indication not to countenance vote buying and the open display of ballot papers during this weekend's superdelegate conference. In a statement signed by Secretary of the Presidential Elections Committee, William Yamwa, the party warned that delegates who flout this directive will be prosecuted. said, and we've placed strong emphasis on it, that no delegates should make any attempt to take photo of where the person would have voted. And if anybody gets to that stage, the security will take charge of it. In the event of a tie among the 10 flag bearer hopefuls during the Special Delegates Congress, the NPP has scheduled a runoff election for September 2 to determine the top five aspirants. The of our constitution, Article 13.19, indicates that there must be first five of the presidential candidates. And so if it is first three, then it means that there will have to be another uh, elections for the two to be elected to add up to five. Renowned economist Kwame Penim has jumped to the defense of the central bank governor, Dr. Ennis Addison, saying he did nothing wrong in advancing monies to a struggling government. Speaking in an exclusive interview with Parkwesi Asari, Mr. Pienim rather lay the blame at the doorstep of the finance minister for failing to report to parliament about the need for the Bank of Ghana to exceed its 5% lending limits due to the crisis situation. We didn't make Bank of Ghana responsible to go to parliament. So when the minister for finance went to parliament to suspend the Fiscal Responsibility Act, somebody from the opposition or from the government should have asked, what happens to Article 36? of the Banking Act. And the minister should have said concurrently, that part is also uh, suspended. Because you cannot suspend the Fiscal Responsibility Act and leave the complementary monetary dimensions side. on the monetary policy side. President Akufado has lauded the BRICS alliance, which he says could boost economic growth. Addressing the BRICS summit in Johannesburg, South Africa, he called for United Nations reforms. Ghana is yet to make a decision to join the alliance. I'm confident a strong partnership with the BRICS nations can help construct a prosperous and self-confident Africa. Now more than ever, strong partnership between the BRICS nations and Africa, reinforced political dialogue, and expanded cooperation in the fields of economic growth and international security are required. We have to work together to achieve our goals 
including a fair, equitable process of energy transition. The Economic and Organized Crime Office, Iyoko, has exceeded its 2023 target by 19 million Ghana CDs, recovering 79 million from tax evasion and financial crimes. The office aims to recover 60 million CDs by the end of this year and 350 million CDs as crime proceeds by June 2028, according to its five year strategic plan. For instance, where you have people, um, organizations, instead of putting their monies into the company's account, they are putting their monies into individuals' accounts. And for that matter, they are not declaring the actual sales or actual profit to the taxman based on where they can assess them on their tax. These are some of the things that we do. That is what we call the recovery. Well, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, former Northern Regional Chair of the New Patriotic Party, that's who is described as a star witness in the center of the alleged plot to remove the Inspector General of Police, Daniel Bugri Nabo, pulls a no show as the parliamentary committee investigating the matter commences sitting earlier today. Now, that's for the uninitiated. Let me give you an idea of what we're talking about here. There was a leaked, leaked tape just about six weeks ago and that got the nation talking that led to the Speaker of Parliament directing a seven-member committee be established. But take a listen to portions of this leaked tape. This will be a competition special prosecutor. I said, I need my tape. And I remember, why do you kill policemen? You have to verify how you are seen. You see how her boy is? Yes. Very, very. And I told you, I'm he is a lawyer. No, I've met him. That is why every policeman wants to see him as his or her. I'm not surprised. You see, this genuine humility. Genuine. That he had a faith in humility. Sir. Say what? Yes, he's the one that we want. Right. Yeah. Now, when you say that, you will see the outcome of the elections. You understand? Yes. And he's a true party man. The president is aware because of the way he's being treated. He decided that even uh, Joe Osim rather agreed with him that you are a party man if these people don't want to deal with the IDP. Well, so that was that leaked audio that captured some persons uh, alleged to be plotting to remove the Inspector General of Police or, in fact, put pressure on the President to remove Dr. George Kofodampari as the Inspector General of Police, according to the persons on the tape, saying that he is not serving the cause of government. And that followed what happened in the Asin North by election. And that is what led to. A number of reactions to this and this caught the speaker's attention as well on this. Well, eventually, Daniel Bugrinabu granted an interview to a journalist at, that's somewhere in Kumasi, specifically the Oyerepa FM, confirming that indeed he had that conversation. But the committee wants to go beyond this. Now, these are the terms of reference of the committee, the seven member committee that the speaker established. Take a look at this. That's what they're going to be looking for right now. First of all, they are talking about the authenticity of the leaked audio recording. That's what they, one of the f things that they're going to be establishing. Two, investigate the conspiracy to remove the current Inspector General of Police. And then also, the third term of reference for, for this committee is to also lead to the establishment of the details of this said, uh, this plot to remove the Inspector General of Police. The final one as well uh, they talk about is investigate any other matter contained in the audio recording and recommend sanctions to persons found culpable where appropriate. Now, earlier today, the chair of this seven member committee, Samuel Atacha, was not too happy because the person who's been described as a star witness in this case, Daniel Bugri Nabu, 
did not show up today. Take a listen to Samala Tachia earlier today uh, at the committee hearing. The committee received a letter yesterday um, under the hand of lawyer Raymond Donyo, yes, um, whose base of practice is Crab, Crab, and Co. Uh, requesting of the committee to excuse. Uh, Mr. N uh, Bugri Nabu, who is supposed to be our first witness. Council is saying that uh, we should excuse him for today on grounds of ill health. Okay, fine. I want to say that um, that could be a reason why we will not do business today, but it is not good enough reason. Well, that's a chair there. Let's go on to Zoom now. And a key member of this committee is also the ranking member on the Defense and Interior Committee of Parliament. James Agaga is joining us. Thank you so much, Mr. Agaga, for your time here on Ghana tonight. First of all, and also let me acknowledge the presence of Kumla Kluche, who is our chief parliamentary correspondent as well, who monitored this committee's sittings earlier today. When did Bugri Nabo communicate to you that he cannot attend to the invitation of the committee to appear before it today? Well, so, um, Alfred, the committee invited Mr. Buri Nabu to appear before it today. Uh, somehow, Buri Nabu did not give indication that he wouldn't be able to make it until yesterday when his lawyer sent a letter indicating that uh, Buri Nabu was indisposed and therefore would not be able to attend the committee sitting today. Uh, the court, we were not uh, you know, too uh, enthused about um, uh, Mr. Buri Nabu's uh, decision to not appear at the last moment because we, we, we thought everything was set for us to commence our work. Now, what even makes the request of Mr. Buri Nabu for the proceedings to uh, uh, be postponed, and we did actually postpone the proceedings today, is it, because, I mean, there was nothing um, compelling by way of an attachment of a medical report to the letter. Uh, requesting for uh, an, a postponement on health grounds. Remember that we are talking about um, a parliamentary committee set up by the Right Honourable Speaker to, to investigate a very sensitive matter, such as the uh, leaked audio. We are clearly vested with powers akin to, you know, what obtains in, in the High Court, at the level of the High Court. We have those powers and, uh, and, you know, that is constitutionally provided for. So we expected that Buri Nabu would have uh, treated the committee uh, with uh, some level of, uh, uh, you know, respect. Uh, be that as it may, we decided to give him the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. and to postpone or adjourn the committee setting to Monday. I see, but be beyond expressing your displeasure, there are no punitive measures to be meted out to persons who fail to appear before the committee in the fashion that you have just described as unacceptable? Uh, it's early days yet. Uh, the man acting through his lawyer uh, gave indication that he's indisposed. We, we gave the lawyer the benefit of the doubt. His lawyer actually appeared before the committee. Uh, now, if... Uh, he does not turn up uh, at the next agenda date, which is at this instance, then the committee would uh, be right to draw certain conclusions. But for now, we don't think that it has gotten to the point where the committee would want to crack the whip. The committee can exact punitive measures as a matter of uh, law, because like I said before, the uh, Constitution clothes the uh, committee with the powers of the High Court in dealing with witnesses. And you know what the High Court can do 
when witnesses are summoned to appear before it and they willfully refuse to, to, to honor the invitation of the court. You know what the court can do in those circumstances. But I, I don't think that uh, this matter has gotten there yet. We expect that uh, uh, Buri Nabu would cooperate with the committee uh, and uh, by appearing before it on Monday uh, to enable the committee uh, deal with its work. I see. Let me bring in. And Mr. Gaga, stay with me a bit. Uh, Kamala, you were there observing the committee's first day of sitting. But give me an idea of the period or the timelines for this particular committee, especially because of what the speaker said when he directed that this seven-member committee be instituted. Well, the speaker was quite clear about what he wanted them to do in terms of the timelines. But Parliament is supposed to resume the first week of October, thereabout. And so the committee's work, I mean, between the time they went to the recess, they were supposed to do all of this, delve into the matter, authenticate the late tape number one, and go into it when need be also where forensics would have to be done. Uh, because of that aspect we saw the committee, that would also be sought. And then they have up to the first week of October where they are going to be resuming to give uh, the report to the speaker and then the house as well. In fact, what the committee basically is going to be doing is to make their report available to the plenary. Don't forget, this is a special committee. This is not one of those select committees of uh, the, the House, but provision is made for this, and they equally have the powers of a high court. And so if, for instance, the question you were asking uh, the Vice Chairman, James Agalda, as to punitive measures, of course, if Bukina chooses to, and hearing, the question has been asked, why Bukrenabu, he's the only one for the time being who is being considered and also considered as a star witness because of the admission he made in that interview he had with a private radio station. And so he is being considered for now. And it's after that, as we speak, the committee knows no other individual who, right. who may or may not have been on the day apart from Bugri Nabu, who has made an admission. Mm. And so after speaking to Bugri Nabu and the delve into it, and hearing is going to be frank because he, he will be speaking under oath. Right. If they are able to do that, that is then when they will be able to proceed. As to the names that may be coming up, as it is now, there's no other name apart from the star witness, as they call him, as uh, Bugri Nabu is appearing before them. And so the house will only picking the reports when they resume the first week, when they resume sitting. Hopefully, that should be the first week of October. Fantastic point. Come on, stay with me. Mr. Mr. Abu, uh, that's a bigger part. Uh, Mr. Gaga, when exactly are you going to be employing this admission by the Bugri Nabo himself in this interview that Komla just referred to? That he has actually admitted in that interview that this is his voice. So how will the committee treat that admission by the star witness in this case? As a fact-finding committee, we don't take anything for granted. You know, Buri Nabu may have spoken to a journalist and, uh, you know, made certain admissions. But the question is, did he make those admissions or have those engagements with the uh, journalist on oath? I think the answer is obvious. And so we, we, we cannot assume that, you know, Buri Nabu uh, spoke the whole truth when he had those engagements with the journalists. So we would expect him to appear before us and testify on oath. Of course, his earlier admissions when he engaged the journalists may be useful, but that cannot be conclusive. Uh, 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 proof of, uh, uh, you know, to not pass the test because those were unsworn statements made. I agree that, yes, if he comes and says or, or speaks differently from, from what he said when he had the engagements with uh, the, the, the journalists, uh, but then his credibility can be on the line. But we, we, we the committee, 
it's a serious committee and would, would, would um, take the testimonies of witnesses on oath. But, but how about uh, the other persons who identify themselves, the voices there who identify themselves as top police officers and, and, and so on um, in there? How would the committee also treat the reports describing these persons as top police officers and some of the commentary as well that has been made by persons who are close to this particular case after this, uh, this tape leaked? I can assure you the committee is not going to witch hunt anybody. Ours is to establish facts. Once we establish the facts, we would then do an evaluation of the, the uh, evidence that would be elicited. And at the, at the tail end of our, we're going to make recommendations. And, and, and submit the recommendations before the entire house for debate and consideration. I so we, we, we are not on a witch hunt, but Ghanaians deserve to know what actually uh, happened. Ghanaians deserve to know whether there are, you know, persons who, uh, you know, are plotting to remove an IGP, uh, with a view to having the opportunity to compromise the integrity of our elections. These are matters that the public wants to know whether indeed persons, you know, have such thoughts in their mind or not. And, and so we will do our best to help establish those facts for uh, our people and make recommendations. Uh, the recommendations I cannot preempt because we haven't, um, you know, distilled whatever evidence uh, would be put before us. I, I see. But once but, we distill the evidence and establish the facts, we can we can proceed to the next level by okay. making recommendations. But uh, how about the, Mr. Kaga, how about the, the two persons who were picked up by the National Investigation Bureau, um, the receptionist of Buginabu and then one person who's been described as his aide? Any updates on them by the committee? We, we don't have any information. Again, I'm sure they were interrogated and granted bail. Uh, they uh, must have been represented by counsel because today... Buri Nabus, uh, about two lawyers actually came to represent him. So, uh, you know, if those two individuals become persons preempt anything, because we haven't him, we'll be able to determine who to call next. Right. Thank you. Uh, come on. When is the committee's next sitting? Well, they are sitting again on Monday, uh, at least after after that that was the excuse was given to Buri Nabu. Uh, through his lawyers, of course. Let me indicate that uh, the the chairman actually expressed his revulsion as this, indicating that he was not pleased with it, but he gave him the benefit of the doubt, meaning that they actually needed further proof, just indicating that he's in this post is not uh, good enough. However, they granted him on the basis of uh, 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 beyond reasonable doubt. And so on Monday, and, 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 and the Monday was actually proposed by his lawyers. And so on Monday, Bukhari Nabu is supposed to appear before the committee. One good thing about this, Alfred, is that, well, this particular, uh, the, this inquest is actually being done uh, before the full glare of the public. Mm. The, the cameras are there. Uh, but there are concerns also as to whether this, does not border on national security, but the defense that members of the committee have been making is that the tape is already out there, and so what is it about national security? However, when it gets to the point where there's a need for some of the people who may be called to appear, depending on the position they hold and the kind of testimony, at least we have the chairman and then his vice chairman as senior lawyers, and so they understand the rudiment of Right. What falls within the law that could also be categorized as a national security issue. They could be excused and that could be taken in, in, in camera. camera. Right. But largely, 
they say that this is actually going to be with a full glare of the public and the cameras will capture everything. Okay, and, and uh, all seven members of the committee were present today? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they, they were all including the, the, the forensic expert or the, uh, the audio expert who, who we are told would largely be dependent on uh, with respect to the authentication of the tape. What I am not aware of is whether he's already authenticated it yet, but uh, to the extent that Bugri Nabu has appeared, well, they could also say that probably because of the admission that he's made. I'm not too sure whether he's already done that, uh, that authentication yet in terms of forensics, but uh, right. the, the full complement of the committee were at the meeting today and it's expected that as time goes on, because also this is a committee right. that has a lot of interest in this, all of them are supposed to be appearing or be attending as duty calls. So mind you, they have left their constituents, even though they are racist now, That's but they right. have to appear before the committee to, to go through with this. Kamala, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for staying up to connect with us. Thank you. Kamala Kloche is our Chief Parliamentary Correspondent. Zagaga, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. A Member of Parliament for the Bosa North constituency he is the Vice Chair of this seven-member committee established by the Speaker to investigate the authenticity of this leaked audio. The plot to remove the IGP is also the ranking on the Defence and Interior Committee of Parliament. Coming up next on Ghana Tonight, renowned economist and NPP stalwart Kwame Pianim defends the governor of the Central Bank against calls for his resignation. But some economists disagree with the position by Kwame Pianim. We, we have that. But just take a listen to this interview that Kwame Pianim, renowned economist, had with my colleague Parkwesi Asari. Once the Bank of Ghana wanted to give beyond the 5% as is mandated by law, it needed to go to Parliament. And that's what the minority ranking member, then ranking member on finance in 2022, Kisela Forsin, said that the bank had printed an amount of 22 billion cities to finance government's budget without parliamentary approval. And your explanation is what? I don't recall that they need parliamentary approval. Mm. Remember, mm. we suspended the Fiscal Responsibility Act when the Fiscal Responsibility Act was removed, it was saying, in effect, we cannot obey the regulation that we have governing the fiscal. All right. Okay. So we are suspending it. When the Minister for Finance went to Parliament and they agreed to suspend the Fiscal Responsibility Act, Parliament should have asked, what happens to the equivalent? That is the Monetary Policy One, which is, I think, Article 36 of the amendment, amended Bank of Ghana Act, which says that if there is an emergency and Bank of Ghana needs to be able to suspend the rules surrounding monetary policy, what they do is to inform the Minister for Finance. It's the Minister for Finance's responsibility to report to Parliament. We didn't make Bank of Ghana responsible to go to Parliament. So when the Minister of Finance went to Parliament to suspend the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Somebody from the opposition or from the government should have asked, what happens to Article 36 of the Banking Act? And the Minister should have said, concurrently, that part is also uh, suspended. Because you cannot suspend the Fiscal Responsibility Act and leave the complementary monetary dimensions side. on the monetary policy side. Because the fiscal part are first the channels of the monetary uh, policy. And this should have been clear. Some yeah. of us heard from the grapevine that he had threatened to resign. What I heard is that he was unhappy. Why was he unhappy? He was unhappy because the severity of the economic crisis was not being communicated, neither to parliament, neither to us, neither to the print and electronic media. And nobody was asking uh, uh, serious uh, question. What is going wrong? Why didn't you just resign? Resignation doesn't solve any problem. If the governor resigns now, what happens? The same minister for finance who, who is at the, at the core of the economic crisis recommends whom? To the president, the same president, 
they appoint somebody who doesn't know the terrain, who hasn't gone through this experience uh, to be able to uh, solve the problem. No. What well, so as Kwame PNM there, Professor John Gachi is a dean of the University of Cape Coast Business School, joining us on Zoom. Thank you, Professor John Gachi, for your time tonight. Now, this is Kwame PNM's argument that don't blame the governor of the central bank. He doesn't agree that he should resign. That bullet should be taken by the finance minister for failing to give the full details of the impact of this DDP on the economy to parliament. Uh, first of all, it is not true that um, there's no arrangement on the side of the monetary uh, side of the economy uh, headed by the Bank of Ghana uh, to deal with uh, a crisis financing. Uh, the, the formula is that during a crisis, the governor, controller and accountant general and the finance minister should meet to determine what they think should be feasible beyond the 5% that should finance the crisis. Then within seven days, that should be sent to parliament for approval or ratification. So it is not true that uh, there is nothing there for the governor and uh, finance minister, etc., cetera, uh, to, to comply with. And that provision was uh, actually neglected and violated. And that is the trouble of uh, the governor. Uh, so it's not it's not like uh, the governor should tell the finance minister and finance minister should lightly uh, report to parliament. But there is a very clear provision. Then again, from a professional point of view, as a governor, when you know that you are financing government activities and that is having or is undermining your role that you play at the last resort for commercial banks uh, is being eroded away. Uh, it is only proper for you to uh, apply break. Uh, you don't need to uh, empty the kitty and make the, 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 the role that you play critical to the financial landscape uh, very fragile. So there are serious inf uh, infractions. There are uh, serious. Um, uh, 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 there are serious uh, issues regarding uh, protecting uh, what the Bank of Ghana stands for uh, collectively. I see. But how about that position that th communicating the details of the extent of the impact of the economic situation? That burden rests on, on the finance minister. And Kwame PNM makes the argument that he had the responsibility to tell the representatives of the people the details of it, that as a result, the Bank of Ghana was going to lose some over 60 billion cities. Then, then parliament is duly informed in detail and not just to be told that or well, the Bank of Ghana is also participating in the domestic debt exchange program. He's not happy. Uh, how, how do we know he's not happy? Because he's not accountable to the finance minister. He's not accountable to the finance minister. At best, he's advisor to the government. So, mm -hmm. and again, he ought to act independently. And in, in order to act independently, he's protected by the law to do so. So if, for example, finance minister represent the executive and represent, uh, for, uh, for example, the political uh, interest. That's right. Uh, so if the politicians are putting pressure on you, you need to look onto the provisions of the law that protects you to act independently. And those are the things that I believe people are talking about. And we need to build a culture. We need to build a culture that people uh, will, will come to terms with the reality that, look, I've gone beyond what I'm supposed to do. 
Uh, I'm not happy about the outing and the result of what has happened. I'm resigning. Those are the value system that we need to create. And those are the culture that we need to build within our governance system. But the moment we say that uh, this person cannot go, uh, it is the finance ministers who put him into trouble, and etc. That means that on one breath, we are saying that a problem has been created, but we can't blame anybody. And that is on the value system in other countries. All right. So, Gachi, appreciate your time. Professor John Gachi is the dean of the University of Cape Coast Business School. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on this. But coming up next year on Ghana Tonight, the National Education Authority, NI, resumes the registration exercise for Ghana cards after having received over 400,000 blank cards. We have details of how the registration is going to be rolled out. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly after this great break. This is Ghana Tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of Flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of Flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the Flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, Flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, Flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. Ready to explore the taste of healthy living with Alpha Cracker from Mugberry. This amazing cracker is rich in milk, butter and other essential nutrients that leaves you wanting more. It's thick and crunchy, affordable and appropriate for all ages. Alpha Cracker, the new king, is in town. Everybody knows Acrobato. And if you know Acrobato, it means you know M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. M Punch Homeopathy Clinic is my pillar. Let's hear what others are saying about M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. Who will be careful for M Punch Wana? Ha! I'm not going to be able to get a job. I'm not going me do so say my name kweye and pass on my name nyina and am agina sabema na me be fear for there e ho na nyina e ji arisa you got everything a half secret m point is my secret m point from your party clinic i'm free when you have the extra bit of ambition in your heart you also need extra bit of energy to come through and for that rush energy is the perfect boost to get over the line created in the usa and proudly made in ghana Thanks to the unique formula, you have the power of ginseng, the benefit of vitamins and all the energy of inositol, taurine and caffeine. Anytime you need to go beyond, Rush Energy will help you get there. rivalries that senior high schools had back then is still present in alumni. Jolali, now or never, we are here to represent our school, St. Mary's Senior High School, Mary's for short. Repping at the Saddle College, Santa Claus, you live in the house. And we are representatives of Winneba Senior High School. You are missing one contestant, your old student, Shatawali. The battle for bragging rights to a particular endeavor remains, of course, still after school. St. Mary's in the lead! Okay, okay, okay! St. Mary's in the lead! St. Mary's in the lead! St. Mary's in the lead!
the heat will be on in the kitchen right here on TV3 on Sunday, 5 p.m. Kitchen Wars Season 2 shows Sundays at 5 p.m. on TV3. Don't miss it. Sponsored by Gino Tomato Mix. And Napa Foods. Say Napa. And ye ono soko. PGL. Welcome back to Ghana Tonight. The National Victory Authority, that's the NIA, has announced that it will resume the registration and issuance of Ghana cards to Ghanaians aged 15 years and above who are first-time applicants for free. Now, that's the emphasis they're putting on it. The exercise, according to the National Identification Authority, will resume in eight out of the 16 regions. The resumption of the exercise has become necessary due to the NIA's receipt of 484,000 blank cards from its technical partners. According to the statement, uh, which we have the copy of the resumption of the registration exercise has become possible due to this development and then also the, does the identity management systems limited and also CalBank PLC making this possible following an initiative by the finance ministry. I'm going to put a few things on the screen so you follow quite closely how the next couple of days is going to look like because from the information we have but next week Monday uh, that's when the uh, registration will resume. 484,000 blank cards received and then also we have details of the next issue also coming up is how the specific dates for the allocation is going to be like. And that's what's going to be on the screen right now. That is the next part, part of the statement. The first phase will last a total of 10 working days beginning Monday, 28th of August, 2023, and ending on Friday, the 8th of September, 2023. So keep these two in mind. 8th to the 28th of August through to the 10th of September. The phase one, restricted registration. This phase will be reserved exclusively for public sector workers on the government of Ghana payroll who are yet to register for the Ghana card. That's for the phase one. The objective is to ensure that such workers are enabled to be verified with their Ghana card on the payroll system of the Controller and Accountant General's Department. Then we, let's look at phase two. And uh, this same phase one, the 10-day registration exercise will focus exclusively on the said public sector workers who will be applying for the Ghana card for the first time. The emphasis has been on for the first time. All such prospective applicants will be required to provide their July 2023 pay slips in addition to meeting the mandatory registration requirements. So these public sector workers who do not have the Ghana card, and I said they would only accept and use for the registration the name of the public sector worker as captured on the July 2023 pay slip of an applicant. So that's for the public sector workers who don't have the Ghana card. So that's for the phase one for this 10 day period. The phase two, that's when the open registration, remember the first part is the restricted registration. For the open registration, the second phase will begin on Monday, 11 September 2023 for all Ghanaians aged 15 years and above who have not yet applied for the Ghana card. That's for 11 September. During the phase two, Ghanaians wishing to replace their lost, stolen or damaged Ghana cards are to correct their names um, or date of birth may do so in accordance with law at any of the NIA's 286 operational offices nationwide offering the free registration. So from the 11th of September, all of these, the qualified Ghanaians, 15 years and above, who are yet to register for the Ghana card, are encouraged to take advantage of this opportunity as the Ghana card serves as the sole mandatory document for the identification uh, of Ghanaians. So that's how things are going to play out um, in the coming days from August 28th, that's this coming Monday, all through to the 11th of September. There's something as well that 
you should take notice of which when we, we saw in the statement from the National Education Authority. Take a look at this. Keep this in mind and please take note of this when you go to the centers. NIA will not entertain or accept requests for the replacement of lost, stolen or damaged Ghana cards or the correction or changing of names or dates of birth during phase one of this registration exercise, which is limited to the public sector workers. They said they are not going to accept any request for the change of names. The public sector workers who are first-time applicants, all they need is your July pay slip. Come with that, and uh, you would go through the process. You'll find all what I put on the screen on 3news.com, also on TV3 Ghana on Facebook for some further information as well. But coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, let's go straight to the Upper East Region where Havoc has been wrecked on parts of the Upper East Region as farmlands are inundated with water following the spillage of the Bahri Dam in neighboring Burkina Faso. Tonight, we hear from the affected people who are demanding a solution to this perennial problem and rather unfortunate developments there. Now, we have videos of some of the farmlands inundated by the floodwaters, maize farms as well, that were ready to be harvested, plus some other residential facilities that have been taken over by the floodwaters as well. And these are the, the farmlands inundated by the floodwaters, the excess water spilled from the Bahri Dam in Burkina Faso. And what you will see there is not a river. We're talking about the farmland that has been taken over by these floodwaters, and mostly maize farms and, and rice farms as well. And it's quite unfortunate the farmers there seen counting their losses as a result of this perennial situation uh, in the Upper East and then the Northeast region as well. We understand some parts of the Upper West region also affected by the spillage of the excess water from the Bahre Dam. Let's hear from some of the, and, and these are farmlands, right? Farmlands and, and, and not just rivers. And let's hear from some of the farmers who have been talking to, to us. Some of us expected, look, the river is far away from here. You have to move kilometers to the river before you get to this side. So how did the water get here? If they had told us earlier, probably would have tried to salvage something small. Look at what is happening. Look at what is left. What am I going to get? Eh? Look at the amount of money we pumped. What am I going to do? Look at this thing. Is it maize? They should do something about the following matter from the Pepper's Dam. At least to solve the problem. Are we breaking the diplomatic arrangement with Burkina Faso? Did the Burkina government tell the government of Ghana that they are going to spill the dam? And if they did, what did they tell us? The officials in Ghana here, did they tell us? Very distraught farmer there. You can understand why. But let's get some answers. George AC is National Communications Director of the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO. Ms. AC, thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First of all, when did you receive the information from the Burkina Faso authorities about the spillage of this Bahra Dam? Yeah, we, we, we got a notice uh, around about 17th of, of August. And we've, we've been getting daily updates. We've been getting daily updates. But on the 17th uh, of August, we got a notice that uh, there is likely to be uh, the spillage uh, any moment from then. I see. And, and, but then, oh, 17th of August, when did the spillage start? I think 21st or 22nd. They started measured one, not in volumes. Uh, they were spilling gradually, not in volumes. I see. That after the 21st, 22nd, when did the flood waters or the excess water from the Bakri Dam get into Ghana? We, we started getting the, this thing uh, 22nd, 23rd, that uh, it was getting down to Ghana uh, because they had not spilled in volumes. Uh, we saw it sipping in, and then uh, we saw places getting flooded because some parts of the 
northeast and northern and upper east regions are experiencing some rains. So uh, that's how come the volumes is now picking up. So 22nd, 23rd, and today uh, we are seeing that is, is uh, rising. Well, we've been speaking to some of the farmers in the upper east region whose farmlands, we understand hundreds of hectares of farmlands have been destroyed by this excess water spill from the Bahre Dam. This, they are blaming you, Nadmo, for not giving them enough prior notice to prepare before the, the spillage. They said they got a notice two days before the, the, the flood waters inundated their farmlands. How come? Because they told us it's not going to be, the spillage is not going to be done in the volumes by which they've been doing it previously. Uh, we were to normally, when we get the notification, we deploy uh, a team to pitch camp uh, in the north, uh, Waliwali, Bolgatanga, and, and Wa, you know, so they can coordinate uh, the activities and then do the community sensitization. This time around, the way it came, we decided to get our local people, the regions and the uh, districts to do the sensitization before we will later deploy the national team to go and join them. So it's the locals that have been uh, doing the sensitization. That's how come uh, it is said that uh, they got just two days notice. Normally we should have, uh, we would be issuing a national press release and then we launch Thunderbolt and then a team moves from headquarters to join them there. Uh, that is yet to be done, but we've asked the local people to do the uh, community engagement and sensitization. That's how come uh, it's not uh, got into them uh, as quick as it should be. But then they also have to deal with their loss of the, the farmlands when destroyed by these flood waters. We've been showing videos of, of them. So if, if you had to do all of this, the protocols of launching Operation Thunderbolt and so on, wh why did you fail to do that? And, and couldn't you have put some measures in place to at least reduce or mitigate the, the impact that we're seeing now? Farmlands, uh, the, the crops are ripe for harvesting. Uh, then we will say they would have done, normally it's in August. Thunderbolt is launched in August. And so the people within the area in August, they know that uh, bagri is likely to be spilled. And, and so they begin to prepare harvest and go. But if the crops are not ripe for harvesting, uh, you cannot go and harvest uh, immature crops. And so that is a challenge to all of us. Uh, we know the farmers have been complaining. Most farm lines are inundated by flood waters. Uh, I just returned from uh, the northern parts of Ghana uh, just last Monday. Uh, we took a two weeks uh, uh, exercise around the place and across the country. And so I was there in Alerugu, Bolgatanga, Zebula, uh, and all those were all Laura, all those places. So uh, we that time the the, the spillage had not gotten down uh, yet. That's what I told you. We had gotten received the let, uh, notification, uh, but it had not gotten down yet till 21st, 2nd, and 3rd that we are having it. So yes, the engagement uh, will, will intensify it and, and probably deploy the Thunderbolt team uh, to pitch camp there to support them. But you see, this is coming after the fact. Your deployment of the Thunderbolt as you indicated, is a protocol that precedes the spillage of the excess water from, from the dam. But that you, you failed to do this year. Okay, but this has become a perennial affair. Every year, the people, the farmers in the Upper East region have to deal with this. So what's the permanent measure, at least, if, that is, if there's any thinking going on? to put some permanent measures in place to deal with this. Because the last time we checked, the Pualugu Multipurpose Dam, and we're going to put this on the screen, um, th that, that particular promise, the $1 billion Pualugu Multipurpose Dam, which, according to the Vice President, was going to flood, that prevent the flooding of farmlands in the Upper East region would help halt the Bahri Dam spillage, this Palugu Dam. What is the state of affairs with, with, with that? 
that we say you see that is if you've received not more if you've received any updates on it this being one of the permanent solutions to address this problem uh, Alfred, you're aware that uh, in 2019, thereabouts, the president cut the set for the construction of the Paul Ubu Dam. All of us, especially at Nadmo, were very much excited about it. Uh, you know, it was a Sino-Hydro project. Uh, unfortunately, 2020 came and we know uh, what, what followed therefrom. And, and uh, the Pualugu projects uh, seem to be at a standstill now. It was meant to have irrigation projects and all that, uh, so the farmers can re-channel the water into uh, good use and then, uh, you know, generate power and all that. So that was part of the whole package. Unfortunately, the project is, is at a standstill as of now. Uh, we just hope and pray that the, the project will commence uh, so it will see the light of day and, and get completed so that all of us, uh, especially those of us at Nadmo and the farmers and the people of the uh, five northern regions where the catchment areas are, uh, will get, get a sigh of relief that uh, we, we are moving away from the perennial uh, challenges I see, but, that but do you have, we are inundated uh, do you, with. Right. Do you have any updates? I mean, yes, it's not within your quarters to, to do so, but do you have any updates on the Pualugu Dam construction? That one, maybe VRA will be in a better position to uh, respond to that, because I, I know VRA uh, was was involved in that, and, and, but as of now, not more, we don't have, uh, as I speak with you, any uh, updates that uh, there's a new commencement date for the Pologu Dam construction. But is there any intervention, any intervention for these farmers who are losing their farmlands um, as a result? Unfortunately, we lost. Uh, that's Georgia, you see there. But this is an issue that is going to continue because it's a conversation that we'll continue having because it's extremely important. And we understand that for as long as the rains continue to fall, the Bakri Dam will, excess water will continue to be spilled and it would flow into Ghana, continuously cause destruction to farmlands and there is no permanent plan to put this excess water to use because as we speak, we don't know when the Pualugu Multipurpose Dam construction would resume. That's the challenge we're dealing with. And so stay with us here across all media general platforms. In the coming days, we'll keep the steam on the situation in the Upper East region and some other parts of the Upper West region, the Northern region, all going to be affected by the spillage of the excess water from the Bakri Dam. We acknowledge the calls from some farmers as we speak who are calling us right now from these regions uh, also sharing their ordeal with us. So this conversation will be sustained in the coming days. Thank you so much for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team, we appreciate your company as always. I am Alfred Akansi. Do have a good night. Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint. Superior durability. Superior hiding. Superior coverage. Simply superior.